In the German town of Oldenburg, a team of researchers hunts down the genes of modern mammals in order to construct their family tree. We can estimate by seeing how similar a gene is in two different species of mammal, how closely related they are. Olaf Beninder Emmons is the author of a 2007 study which analyzed the genes of 99% of animals living today. This mammoth task required eight months of DNA sequencing to track the genetic mutations of 60 markers throughout the evolution of mammals. The molecular data will give us a much more complete picture. We have DNA here for many more species than we have fossil data for. The fossils will give us point estimates throughout the tree. The DNA will fill in the gaps and give us all the divergence times for all the species of mammals and all the common ancestors that were. This method, called the molecular clock, shows that placental mammals separated from marsupials 160 million years ago during the Jurassic period, then diversified during the Cretaceous period to form the current main groups, rodents, carnivores, and primates. An unexpected result, since no fossil of these early mammals has ever been discovered. This was interesting because there's a very big disconnect between molecular studies and fossil studies. In Pittsburgh, on the other side of the Atlantic, another study offered very different results. It is the work of John Wibble, a paleontologist at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Its starting point was the discovery of a skull found in a 75 million year old deposit in Mongolia. Named Malestis gobiensis, it has been studied from every angle since it does not belong to any known species. 400 of its morphological features have been compared to those of 82 fossil or living mammals. What we did is we looked at the individual morphological features of this animal across a broad array of other fossil forms and living mammals to try to figure out what it was, what it was related to. And our study supported the traditional view that there were no fossils living during the Cretaceous that were members of the placental group itself. There were only the ancestors of the placentals living. Which of these two studies should we believe, fossil or genetic? The molecular studies all tend to say that the crown group orders, rodents, primates, carnivores, bats, they all have their origins in the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs were still alive. The problem is there's absolutely no fossil evidence supporting this. Many of these modern groups, according to the molecular clock analyses, actually are, they should be present in the Cretaceous record. We can't find them. There's no doubt that there were placental mammals in the Cretaceous. What's debated is what kind of placental mammals they are. And it's a question of who's right at the moment. To achieve the most complete mammal family tree, both types of data will need to be refined, defining the pace of genetic mutations on one hand and seeking fossil beds on the other, since new fossils would confirm the geneticist's hypothesis. In the meantime, paleontologists are also trying to understand how these early mammals protected themselves from dinosaurs. The ability to nurse their young could have been a benefit.
if we want to understand how modern theorems come from, we need to look at modern theorems' distant relatives. Zangiotherium is a mammal that is even more ancient than placental mammals. This extremely well-preserved fossil was discovered in China in 1997. We can be relatively sure it is a mammal because it had fur, and associated with fur would be a whole series of reproductive features. And so we know that it must have nursed its fetuses, but we don't know if the fetuses was born either in an egg or a live fetus. Lactation offers an advantage when food is scarce, since the young continue to be fed thanks to their mother's body reserves. Lactation first appeared in the form of hundreds of milk-producing glands on the abdomen, just like modern platypuses. The young would lick the thick milk from their mother's hair. Zangiotherium has another characteristic in common with monotremes, like the platypus, a spur on its hind leg. This species definitely has uh, another fossil that has preserved with a bony spur, and uh, it's also consistent with the first observation directly from this particular specimen. In modern monotreme, this spur is definitely used for self-defense, but we do not know if it is truly poisonous or it's just a bony spur. Snakes have fangs. Insects can sting. But this defense technique is rare among modern mammals. Located on the male's hind legs, this spur may have released a venom capable of paralyzing their foes. According to scientists, this weapon is not terribly efficient since it takes time for venom to have an effect. As they evolved, they tried other strategies like running away. And to improve this tactic, what better than a superior sense of hearing? The evolution of ear bones was a key advantage for primitive mammals. In 2011, the discovery of this Leoconidon fossil shows at last how the jaw bones of these reptiles migrated to form the middle ear of modern mammals 120 million years ago. This specimen is the most complete mammal we have ever found in Western Liaoning. All the bones are preserved here. So it's a very beautiful specimen. Especially, the, this specimen preserves some tiny bones of ear region. This ear ossicles usually is very difficult to be preserved in fossils because it's very tiny. More important, it is a transitional stage of the mammalian middle ear evolution. In ancient mammals, the lower jaw was linked to the skull by an elongated bone. In Liaconodon, this evolved to begin forming the ear bones. The hammer, anvil, and tympanic ring became completely detached in modern mammals to form the inner ear. Amazingly, every mammal embryo including humans, reproduces this evolutionary phase in the womb, resulting in the formation of the inner ear. This precision tool allows us to analyze everything that happens around us constantly. Yes, you can hear the dangerous earlier than the other kind of animals, so it helps them to escape from the predator. 
the mystery of the inner ear bones, a link with our reptilian past, is cleared up thanks to this new fossil. Another mammal weapon, teeth, reveal their secrets at the University of Washington in Seattle. This is where Gregory Wilson uses state-of-the-art technology to analyze the teeth of multituberculates, mammal species that became extinct 34 million years ago. We found some really exciting results, actually. What we found is that these multituberculates that were living alongside dinosaurs actually undergo an adaptive radiation 20 million years before dinosaurs go extinct. And what we see is that they go from having teeth with a few cusps on them, such that they can eat insects and so on, to having teeth that have many different cusps or tools, such that they can exploit a new resource in flowering plants. It's that ability to exploit that new resource that allows them to expand in terms of numbers of different species of multituberculates, as well as the range of body sizes that they have, such that they were able to survive the mass extinction that killed off dinosaurs. His study shows that multituberculates evolved well before the extinction of dinosaurs. They moved from an insect-based diet to a diet based on fruit, or even angiosperms, flowering plants that appeared during the Cretaceous period. To reach this astonishing result, Gregory Wilson used fossils collected over a hundred years in Montana's Hell Creek Formation. By studying this collection of tiny teeth under a microscope, he was able to familiarize himself with the many species of multituberculates. This is the largest of uh, multituberculates that lived, uh, the size of maybe a beaver or a marmot. Uh, and it has many, many bumps all along the tooth row. And those bumps act as tools to crush and grind food. Um, another example sits inside this tiny vial. It's a, another multituberculate, but it also had teeth with many little bumps. So this was a smaller version of this animal that lived during the time of dinosaurs. This lineage we've known about for a very long time, but it's been difficult to really quantify or understand what the shape of those teeth mean. We've tried many different approaches, but none have really uh, been able to give us the precision that we can now attain today. This technological revolution came in the form of the CT scan, a medical imaging tool nowadays used by paleontologists. Specimens like this 67 million year old tooth are first scanned with X-rays on a microscopic scale it is identifiable by its long incisor, but what intrigues researchers is the complexity of its molars. Once the data is collected, cartography software reconstructs an accurate map showing the shape of the teeth. Gregory Wilson has found that carnivores have a fairly simple tooth structure, with approximately 110 cusps per row of teeth, while multituberculate teeth are far more complex with up to 348 cusps. This particular specimen that I just pulled up has uh, about 250 different complex little tools on the surface of its tooth row. And those little tools help break down plant material that needs to be processed very finely in order to be digested properly. So these guys have evolved towards eating plants. It 
It is this key function of grinding which promoted the explosion of herbivore and omnivore species, an ecological niche untapped by primitive mammals. Despite these multiple discoveries, at the end of the 20th century, the crucial question about the origins of the first real mammals remained. Once again, the Liaoning region provided the answer. In 2011, Chinese farmers found the fossil of a mammal called Jeremiah Sinensis, meaning Jurassic mother from China. The paleontologist Xie Xilou has come for the first time to visit this area, which stretches over several miles. It is not an easy task to identify fossil-bearing rocks under the fields of lush corn. But he is guided by a local specialist in feathered dinosaurs, whose oldest specimen, Anchionis, was excavated on a site close to this one. It's exciting fossil discovery because it gave us a new milestone as to when the placental lineage first start to appear on Earth. And uh, all the modern placental mammals have a deep root into the Jurassic and is coming from right here. These rocks also are embedded with volcanic ashes and this site had been dated by geochronology to be 160 million plus or minus a little bit. So we know for sure this rocks actually belong to the late Jurassic. The Jeremiah Sinensis fossil is the oldest specimen of a placental mammal and is a critical piece of the puzzle in the evolution of mammals. It was identified by its teeth, which included molars, canines, and incisors. As the genetic studies of living mammals showed, their origin is much older than existing fossils had suggested, since the discovery of Jeremiah means that placental mammals must have appeared at least 35 million years before Aomaya scansoria. And even though paleontologists are still seeking fossils from the Cretaceous period, belonging to current groups like rodents or carnivores, this discovery brings the conflicting opinion of geneticists and paleontologists closer together. Independent corroboration by fossils on one hand and by molecules on the other gave us the confidence that we are getting closer to the correct answer. With Jeremiah, we know that 160 million years ago, Mammals already had the characteristics that made them successful. Fur, complex teeth, and acute hearing to escape predators and locate their prey. The general adaptation, such as insect worry, and such as capability to move on the tree, gave this particular mammal some evolutionary advantage, it is really equipped it well enough already in the late Jurassic for its descendant to thrive after the dinosaur's extinction. Certainly, the mammal's ancestors were very small in the time of dinosaurs, but much more varied and better equipped than was previously thought, with advantages that we find later in primates, our closest relatives. <laughs> 